There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel, and I'm here with a very special guest. This is Dan. I'm not sure if I should say formerly of or just of the fabulous Booktube channel, the Weird Book Book Club. Hello, Dan. Hello, Sean. Thanks for having me back. So great to, to be collaborating with you. We are here to talk about a novel. Um, I think the genre is a little bit debatable. We'll probably get into that. It's a work of fiction by the Croatian writer Dasha Derndich. Battle Songs, and the translator is Celia Hawksworth. And Battle Songs is the American title. The British edition of the English translation preserves the Italian title of the Croatian language original, if, I, if that makes sense, which is uh, Canzone di Gira. Just uh, to, to make it even more clear, the original was not written in Italian, but he uses the Italian phrase canzoni di gira, which means battle songs. Originally published in Croatian in 1998, so that is a fairly early Derndich. The translations were 2022. And it's described in the American edition, all right on the cover, as a novel. It's actually a series of arguably standalone short stories so you can think of it as a short story cycle maybe we'll talk about that or maybe we just won't get to it because we're too busy talking about other things in any event the protagonist leaves yugoslavia with her daughter sarah and, and goes to canada as a refugee during the 1990s during the breakup of the in the years following the breakup of yugoslavia and things don't go well for her there and there's lots about Canada that makes Canada look quite accurately as a rather shithole place to, for anybody to be who is not white, Anglo, Saxon, Protestant. There's also lots of stuff about the Yugoslav wars and going back to with horrific details about Yugoslavia during the Second World War and the fascists, the Ustasha, that also form important parts of these stories, which together make this important, serious, and devastating work of fiction. So, Dan, this was a cheery book. Um, what did you think? <laughs> well, thanks again for having me, Sean. I uh, just want to say, even though it's not a particularly gay book, it is almost gay pride at the time of our discussion here. So I had to uh, have you here in my bedroom, and I will be showing at least partial bush this evening, Kate. She's looking over our discussion here, although <laughs> her work has little to no relevance to the the story at hand. I just wanted to, you know, do that and also show off my fine edition, which contains oh, oh what's that? Why it's a uh, a free item you can get as a as a Patreon supporter of Sean the Book Maniac. Sean, you kept me company throughout my reading of this book, and I thank you for that as well. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, uh, I think both of us had read some of uh, Dernich's work prior to this, and we both knew that we were fans of her particular brand of, I mean, <laughs> you can't just call it depressing because there is like always this very visceral uh, drive behind the narrative events. It's not... I mean, many of the characters are sort of on the verge of giving up or breaking down or just succumbing to the daily pressures of, I mean, in this case, refugee life, leave your, your home country, which is in desperate military, you know, uh, military conflict turmoil. But there's never a sense, and in particularly in this one, I felt like you never thought that the main character, the the narrator, was just going to give up. Like she had her daughter with her, she had a lot of pointed unwillingness to conform to the expectations of Canadian society. She continued to do some of her like historical research while she was in Canada. Um, you know, sort of holding on to pieces of her professional identity or personal passions, whatever was driving her to do this research. So as much as the <laughs> events under consideration could easily be a very dark and dreary uh, setting, I think 
what is always incredible to me about Dern Dutch's writing is that she engages with these things in a way that still feels very forceful and alive and not as someone who is just sort of flinging <laughs> the atrocities of history at the reader one after another to kind of like break them down. It's really, there's maybe some hope that experiencing and resurfacing some of these events would have a positive difference on the present and around the people that are reading it. So, you know, as far as this book in particular, I, I really loved it. And I think that of the books that I've read by her, which are, you know, I haven't read all of her works that have been published in English. I've only read Belladonna and a like, kind of a novella called um, Doppelganger. And of those three, I would probably say that this is where I would recommend people start because it does have a lot of the historical detail and richness and outrage and harrowing experiences that you will very consistently encounter throughout her work but there is a more kind of like personal core to it I feel that of all of the narrators in the books I've read by her, this, I don't know if she's ever given a name or maybe it's mentioned in passing, but she definitely feels the most present as like a, a person I can imagine in sort of like day to day life versus someone who is just overwhelmed by the weight of history and events and possibly slowly going insane. I mean, a lot of <laughs> uh, her characters are in rather desperate straits. And this one was one you could, you know, always root for and <laughs> keeps you going throughout the book, even as it takes some unexpected turns. Uh, well, that was so incredibly well put that I think we're done here. So um, <laughs> uh, it brings our video to a close. I have nothing to add. Uh, that was a really uh, precisely on point set of comments. We have a little bit more to say, but you know, that was a great, great way to get started. Yeah, I loved it too. I found the first, maybe third, really disorienting. And again, it's probably because I'm always reading so many books at a time and that I would only pick this book up maybe twice a week. And I was really having trouble getting my footing with it. But once I did, it's not like I sailed through the rest of it. I did not ever sail through this book, but that it became a torturous um, pleasure rather than a torturous kind of dog's breakfast of a reading experience. I loved what she taught me about the country of my birth. I already had many reasons to think that Canada's reputation as being one of the goody-goody countries was totally undeserved, and I now have a bunch more. So that was an eye-opener and incredibly well done. Much like Trieste, which is the only other of Dernditch's works that I've read, one of her preoccupations is the, the all the genocides of the Europe in Europe in the 20th century, uh, the Holocaust being the big one, but also in uh, Yugoslavia. Um, well, let me ask you because I don't know if I'm clear on this, Dan. Do they do, is it considered that the persecution of the Jews in Yugoslavia is that part of uh, the Holocaust? Do you know? Yeah, I, I believe it's you know all in keeping with the World War II period and the Ustasha that she refers to, I believe were sort of the, they're almost like the uh, Yugoslav version of like the Vichy government in France, you know, that once they were being occupied by the Nazi forces, there were people who were very willing to collaborate with the Nazis and root out or, you know, collaborate in the process of genocide, to put it very bluntly. Um, so we can put it under that same horrible category. And Dern Ditch is understandably preoccupied by the horrors of the Holocaust and conveys the immensity of it in a way that, you know, I can't take, I can't take in a, a fraction of what she's throwing at me. I'm not sure if I like that phrase, but what she's presenting to me, but it's still such a powerful reading experience. And one of the ways I remember in Trieste that she expressed that incomprehensible immensity was to have a list of, what was that list of? Do you remember? Oh, you haven't read it. 
uh, anyway, there was a list of a, of a uh, that was about 50, 40 pages, just a list of names. And she wanted you to read that and absorb that as a way of coming to terms with at least a tiny part of the of the Holocaust. So that impulse is here in this early Durnditch novel. And I certainly would echo what you said about the fact that the protagonist, I only, I don't remember ever seeing her named in the novel, but I found at least two reviews that called her Tia. And her daughter is definitely Sarah. She's about, what, 10 years old when they come to Canada? And they were really alive as characters in a literary novel in a way that contextualized a lot of the, the history that we were reading about as well. Mm-hmm. Definitely in this novel, there is some consideration about, you know, how historical events or the maybe the trauma from historical events is sort of being passed down and conveyed generation to generation. You know, certain things are lost or purposely covered up or just never discussed because the people who went through them didn't ever want to bring them up again. And I think that the narrator seemed to be, you know, she's looking back in history, but she's also very much in the present, not at all sure in in several instances how she's really going to make their life work in Canada. There was a particularly harrowing <laughs> section of the book, I think, towards the end, where the narrator is trying to get some extra money towards the holidays to buy her daughter a new pair of shoes and is basically kind of taken with another group of, of, uh, I think they're largely Croatian or, you know, refugees from the same region as the narrator. And uh, they're supposed to be stuffing envelopes at this wealthy, (laughs) uh, the, the person who hires them is also maybe not from Canada originally, but they're definitely willing to, exploit refugee labor (laughs) in very the working conditions are very strange and sketchy to say the least and in the end uh well i don't i won't spoil what happens but i think that the narrator made a very correct decision and how she uh, decided to navigate that although it was yeah very uh it got more and more sinister as the time went on you're really kind of wondering what what's going to happen absolutely and that was in toronto and the yes, and it was a uh, stuffing envelopes, but yes, it was uh, really quite a striking story. So let's talk for a minute about genre. What is this? It's, it's described uh, in the American edition as a novel. It's very obviously broken into chapters that have titles that I think would have a standalone vitality, but I didn't read them in a standalone way. So, uh, what do you think? What is this? What the hell is this, Dan? <laughs> It, I would say, I mean, yeah, they're stylistically, it's a very diverse and, you know, I can imagine Durnditch's process in writing this book, although I have absolutely no evidence for this, but clearly she did a lot of research and she did have professional experience in doing sort of like radio production um, and there's talking, you know, there are several uh, kind of one one chapter or section is organized in sort of like fragments of monologue or dialogue, different Yugoslav refugees uh, living in Canada, you know, what life used to be like, what they're having to do now just to get by day to day. There's this weird, for me, uh, I was really struggling not to see the narrator as Dasha Drindic, although I really don't know to what extent this is really representative of her experience in Canada. So, you know, you have, you have the monologues from a, from a radio program or like a, a documentary production for radio, and you have one section that's like a very well-researched historical analysis of former Nazi officers or Ustasha, the Nazi collaborators who were very gratefully accepted into Canada and other countries post-World War II and sort of the persistently calling attention to the fact that 
if one is expecting a sense of justice from you know doing really intense historical analysis and, and digging, you're going to find a lot of instances where the the guilty party was not punished and in fact was for whatever reason allowed to move on with their life and live to a ripe old age. I, I enjoyed the variety of styles in this novel. I could see if you were looking for or hoping um, to have more of a consistent voice, you would probably be a little bit disappointed, but it's just, for me, it's always interesting to see like what Drindich is going to do because honestly, so much of the subject matter is completely new to me. She's definitely not presenting it in like a conventional, you know, historiographic way. And there always feels like there's this deliberate intention behind what she's presenting you. Although like as you're being bombarded with all these like random facts, you're like <laughs> almost, I think you mentioned feeling overwhelmed. I mean, I, I think it is definitely an author that you're, it, it can feel like it's really sort of, almost burying you under an avalanche or, or something like that. But I do feel that there is a, a sense of continuity and connection through the various chapters that does reward, you know, reading them as like a full set, even though the chronological order is all sort of disjointed, but there is particularly um, a dynamic with her daughter, Sarah. And I think in an earlier chapter as some part i think it's some part of like the immigration procedure um she's being asked about the father of her daughter and she refuses to give the answer that the questioner desires and so <laughs> it doesn't put her in a good position but she's very insistent that you know she does not her daughter does not have a father and what's the story behind that well towards the end there is a kind of a a reveal about you know the narrator's personal background and how they came to be a family in the first place so there's definitely a through line that you know a, a sort of a question mark that's presented to you in an earlier section that is seen through to the end in a satisfying way later on so i definitely think that it, it works as a whole, even though it's quite <laughs> all over the place in some regards. This is not my phrase. It's not my insight, but I'm going to uh, quote it here. It's from some review that I found online that one of the most original things, one of the most, uh, one of the unique things about Dasha Dernish's writing is her startling juxtapositions. And this uh, entire collection, if that's what it is, or this entire novel um, is just one series of juxtapositions. And often, one half of the juxtaposition is the personal story of the protagonist and her daughter, Sarah. And it's juxt or or a, a backstory with some member of her family, like a grandfather, grandmother, and so on, that's juxtaposed with seemingly random, but that you just got to stay with this the text for a few more pages to realize it's not at all random series of historical details about something like a pig consumption in Yugoslavia in the 20th century and so on to make her points through those juxtapositions. So what you just said about uh, the protagonist and her daughter and being the through line, I think absolutely. And then she just brings in all of her social, political, historical obsessions in the juxtapositions then through which that story is told. I think it's a novel or a work of fiction that would really repay uh, reading it more than once. Um, one of the things that I enjoy about reading Drindich's novels, it's almost one of those, she's almost one of those writers where you wanna have like a Google tab open and, and at the ready, just because she's so confidently drawn together from all of these historical events and from a locality that I just am very unfamiliar with. And if you're someone who likes to have a narrative help introduce you into a historical context, I think she's a really good writer to explore in that regard because, you know, it can be kind of overwhelming even in like a sort of a traditional history 
just seeing everything from a very big picture perspective, it has this sort of like level of organization imposed on it to sort of give you a full narrative sweep of these events that it can kind of feel like these things are almost predetermined or that they didn't really have like individuals almost feel like they weren't even really ever truly involved except for maybe a few major actors but i like to i like the ability to see sort of historical events from the perspective of like someone on the ground someone who is you know has a life and things at stake and a history and of their own and their thrust into these events and things occur in a messy haphazard way only after the fact you get to try and kind of make something out of that and decide what it all meant and so there's something about the experience of reading it through her narrator's perspectives that feels very i don't know if authentic is a good uh, descriptor for it but it, it gives a human face to a lot of these things that i would never have otherwise been motivated to learn about. And I did do some very, very light research just to understand sort of what was what were the dynamics leading up to the breakup of the former uh, Yugoslavian Republic and, you know, how did things seemingly get so bad so quickly? And, you know, obviously there were conditions that had been present for a long time previously, but it was just a, a good entry point into a, a really very complex topic. So <laughs> I'm glad to have Drindic there as, as a guide, someone whose work I, I look forward to returning to uh, frequently in the future. Absolutely. I think I want to share a quote from uh, one of my favorite novels, which is uh, Constellation of Vital Phenomena by Anthony Mara. And this line, I think it might be the epigraph or, or is it in the actual novel? I can't remember, but the, the line is, it's a question. What did any one person matter when pounded against the anvil of history? Hmm. And uh, I think this novel is a rather stunning answer to that question or beginning of an answer to that question. But to link that to what you just said, I think the link is obvious, but I'll make it even more obvious. That in having a protagonist that is so ferociously inquisitive about making all the connections of her history and the history of her family and the history of her region, her country, with the personal story of her and her daughter trying to hobble, you know, trying to get along in a new culture that isn't very welcoming of them, that linkage makes it um, just incredibly important book, I think. Well, this was uh, very stimulating. I'm stimulated up to my nipples. Dan, are you stimulated up to your bush? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, yes. She looks very stimulated. Let's <laughs> do it again. <laughs> Absolutely, Sean. Thanks again for the opportunity to talk with you. Thanks, everybody, for watching.